Okay, welcome everybody. Um, as I mentioned earlier, my name is Gary Bader, uh, and we, our research is focused on pathway and network analysis, so we can answer a lot of different questions um, about different types of network and pathway analysis of any kind of genomics data. This workshop tends to focus mostly on gene, uh, analyzing transcriptomics data because it's a um, most common type of data that people have. Um, but the concepts that we're focusing on are, we try to make them very general. So we can, uh, you can use those concepts and translate them to any, any uh, uh, different type of genomics data and every, any type of organism. Um, and then for people that are working on data types that we don't cover because we can't cover every type of data type in, in every way, um, we can answer all of your questions uh, during the break and um, whenever we have opportunities to, to chat about things. Uh, we've probably analyzed the type of data that you have, have uh, and, um, and we can point you to papers where we've shown, done these types of workflows on different types of data. Um, okay, so um, uh, although not every type of data and every type of organism is uh, easy to analyze um, because uh, sometimes there are tools available that are more focused on human or E. coli or something, a sort of major model organism. Um, and uh, if you're working with a newly sequenced genome or something like that, there might be more challenges. But we can help you with that as well. Okay, so I'm just going to start by um, talking about uh, a number of basic concepts that will, uh, the aim of this initial uh, section is to bring everyone up to the same speed. So some people may know some of these concepts, but they're probably new for other people. So we're going to go over everything um, and, and, and start from the beginning. So the, the point of this workshop is um, to help people analyze data that they've generated from genomics data. And usually that ends up being some kind of gene list or metabolite list or some list of things or, or items. And, um, and it's great when you, have, you get that data and it worked, it's amazing, but then you have a thousand or five thousand result, you know, different results and now what do you do? So um, that's a very common problem and, uh, and, and this whole workshop is, is focused on, on helping you in that. So the major question that we want to know is what's interesting about the set of genes or other molecules that you, that you have. And typically, um, the sort of standard approach of ranking or clustering the data, if you have multiple samples, can help you identify um, things that have the strongest signal or patterns that are similar across your data. Um, but uh, it doesn't help you interpret the, the results in a biological way. So one thing, one way that people have found is incredibly useful for in helping interpret large-scale data uh, is pathway analysis and network analysis. And um, so if you say, what's interesting about these genes, you can ask, well, maybe they, they uh, are enriched in some type of pathway that we know about. Like, oh, all of the genes that I found are, you know, mostly related to the cell cycle. What does that mean? Um, so that, that's much more sort of interpretable, easy to, easy to understand. So, um, yeah, so the idea is that, you know, if you didn't have some kind of analysis tool to help you analyze this data, you'd have to go through those genes one by one, looking at the literature and putting all the pieces together yourself. So pathway and network analysis in general is uh, a type of a method that helps you gain mechanistic insight into large-scale data. Um, and it may be identifying a master regulator or drug targets or characterizing pathways that are active in a sample. Um, and uh, in my view, it's uh, any kind of pathway, it's any kind of analysis that involves any kind of pathway or network uh, information. Um, and it's most commonly applied to help interpret lists of genes, but you can use it for lists of small molecules and, and anything else, um, genomic regions. Uh, the most popular type is pathway enrichment analysis, and we'll talk about that today. But there are many others that are useful, and we'll go over different ones in different parts of the, the lecture. So I wanted to start, uh, I, I want to next go over two examples of pathway analysis that were particular, particularly success, successful. So these are examples that we've been involved in, um, sorry, from our own research projects in collaboration with others. 
and uh, but it illustrates some of the things that you can do with with this type of analysis. So the first example is an analysis of autism spectrum disorder. So autism spectrum disorder is a is a um, you know mostly genetically inheritable. Uh, disease uh, or syndrome that um, or, or spectrum that affects um, uh, 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 people starting at a young age. Um, when I started working on this, I didn't realize how heritable it was, but it's more than um, you know. It's it's highly concordant among identical twins, um, and it's more than fifty percent heritable. So one of the things that people have discovered is that. Uh, with this this disorder is that um, de novo copy number variants that are rare play an important role in the genetics. And this is work done with Steve Scherer, who's at the Hospital for Sick Children here, who focuses on this on the genetics of this disease. So uh, the Scherer lab um, collected about a thousand cases and a thousand controls, uh, very severe aut uh, autism spectrum disorder cases, and uh, genotyped everybody with uh, SNP arrays. Uh, and use those to call copy number variants. So SNP arrays measure the intensity of DNA uh, uh, signal at different positions. And, um, and if you have a bunch of high intensity positions in a row, that's a, that could be a, a gain of copy number. If you get no uh, uh, s signal across a, a range of SNPs on the chromosome, that could represent a deletion. So you could use this, to, this information to identify gains amplifications and deletions in the genome. And, um, and they found a number of uh, uh, copy number variants that were associated with autism, um, but not that many, about 10 genes in total uh, from all their copy number variants. If they just looked at genes that were enriched in deletions, for instance, in the cases versus controls. Um, and so we looked at this data and we um, tried to find not, not just if uh, a, a specific gene is affected um, at the uh, um, associated with cases. If a specific gene is, is particularly associated with cases. Um, we uh, uh, compared to controls. We looked at whether specific pathways were affected uh, compared to controls. Um, and what we found was a, a rich set of pathways that that. Um, you see my mouse pointer here. Yeah. So we found a, a rich set of pathways that. Oops. That were um, uh, enriched in in deletions compared to control uh, in cases compared to controls. All these little circles here, uh, each one of these represents a pathway, uh, a set of genes, um, and the the lines connecting these circles are um, overlapping genes that are shared between the pathways. Uh, and um, and we can zoom in on one of these things, and we can see that a lot of the pathways, for instance, were involved in central nervous system development, which makes sense given the biology that this is a, a brain disorder or brain a, a disorder that affects the brain. Um, and um, what was interesting here is that uh, it wasn't the same gene that was affected over and over again, but if we looked at a set of 20 genes in the pathway, they were affected, at, you know, you might have... Um, one gene affected per patient, say one gene deleted per patient, per individual. But when you looked at the pathway, you found this pathway was constantly getting affected by deleted genes uh, and in a, in a statistically significant way. Um, and it's, so it's a pattern that you couldn't see at the gene level, but at the pathway level, you kept on seeing the same pathways over and over again, um, but not the same genes. So that's where pathway en en enrichment analysis can help um, when that you have a situation like that in your data, which is fairly common. Um, the other, the other uh, uh, little uh, symbols on this plot represent pathways that were enriched in known intellectual disability genes and also uh, known autism genes here. Um, and so there was overlap between pathways, even though the, the genes that were known to be involved in uh, intellectual disability and autism um, were not seen to be mutated over and over again, the pathways that they were affecting and the pathways that were, effect were being affected in the copy number variant, the new copy number variants that were mapped were very similar. Um, so that was also interesting and helped validate the results. Um, the second example is a cancer example. So this is a uh, analysis of ependymoma. Ependymoma is uh, a, a brain cancer. Uh, it's the third most common brain tumor in children. Um, it affects the ependymum, which is the lining of the central nervous system. And uh, for many years, people have known that 
Um, and there, there's no known therapy for this disease other than radio, radiation and, and uh, surgery, which is devastating because this affects young children and brain surgery in young children basically leads to a poor quality of life. So um, ideally you would be able to find some, uh, some better therapy, more targeted therapy. Um, so the only thing that people knew about this disease, they didn't know anything about any mechanisms, was that it, depending on where it occurred in the brain, it would have different outcomes. And the most serious outcome uh, would, is if the uh, tumor appeared in the posterior fossa, which is the, the back of the, the head, the brain stem, and the cerebellum. So if it's, people knew for many decades that if uh, it was uh, occurred there, then that was bad. Um, and that's also happens to be the most common location for this tumor. Um, so Michael Taylor, who's a neurosurgeon at sick, also at Sick Children's Hospital here, um, collected tumors and uh, analyzed, uh, collected transcriptomics data. Anywhere you want. Um, collected uh, transcriptomics data on all these tumors and was able to cluster them, which means that you identify samples that are similar and you group those together. And there were two major groups that, that appeared. One uh, called posterior fossa type A affects the youngest patients and had, has a terrible outcome. And the other one affects uh, type B affects the oldest patients and has an excellent outcome. So even though people thought just based on anatomical location that this tumor uh, is very serious, it turns out there's actually two different diseases in the same anatomical location. One's really bad and that's where the bad signal came from. And the other one is uh, actually has an excellent prognosis. And so based on this, they can already start tuning therapy. Um, but uh, we wanted to know more about the, the mechanisms, and Michael collected whole genome sequence and exome data on a number of these tumors. And interestingly, there was no mutations identified, no recurrent mutations. Like each sample had up to three mutations or so, something. So it's very silent. Um, so there may be various reasons for that because it's a pediatric cancer and there have been time for mutations to develop. But the the, uh, but it, unfortunately, it didn't help tell us anything about the mechanism of this tumor. So then Michael uh, and the team moved to look at DNA methylation, um, again, with a, an array, uh, looking at CPG island methylation. And um, if you have a, a whole series of very strong methylated signals in a promoter region, there's a good chance that that gene uh, is going to be uh, silenced. So um, it turns out that the serious A type is much more transcriptionally silenced than the B type. And there were about 2,000 genes that were differentially methylated between A and B. So um, we looked at that. Um, the, the sort of standard pathway analysis methods didn't actually work right away with this, um, but we used a, a more st statistically uh, appropriate um, test and also uh, because the data was very sparse and we also used a, a much bigger database of pathways than is typically available and we'll tell you about how to do that. Um, and uh, so this was work done by Scott Zeiderdine who's a postdoc in my lab. Um, and interestingly the only pathway that was, ex uh, was enriched in these 2000 genes compared to what you'd expect were pathways related to was basically a uh, pathways related to the PRC2 complex. So PRC2 is the polychrome repressive complex 2. It's involved in methylating histones and then DNA gets methylated so it's an epigenetic regulator. Um, and uh, so, we, you know, um, I should explain this plot here. So this, um, the, the, the length of these bars is proportional to the significance of the, the uh, pathway, uh, the significance of enrichment of the pathway. And each of these pathways here EED targets and SUS12 targets. These are actually proteins that are subunits of the PRT, PRC2 complex. And this is another one that sort of combines a bunch of different uh, targets of the PRC2 complex. So all of the pathways here that were, um, that were uh, enriched um, past um, sort of a, a threshold here uh, were related to the PRC2 complex. And as you can see, there was hardly anything that came up in the group B. Um, okay, so this is really interesting because it represents the first target, uh, molecular target that we know about this disease, uh, at least in the group A types. And, uh, and people have actually developed 
small molecules that inhibit the methyl transferase in the PRC2 complex. And you can get these. Um, these were tried in cell lines and mouse models associated with this, this tumor, and they it, it, it showed promising results. And then even more interestingly, um, there was a, a patient at the hospital here um, who came in and had had reached the end stage of this disease, the tumor, the appendomoma, he had this type A appendomoma, had, had metastasized to the lung, and um, it had, um, in two months, this uh, lung metastasis here had doubled in size, um, and there was no other treatment options for the patient, so they were, you know, basically, um, re as I said, reached the end stage. So on compassionate grounds, uh, this patient was treated with a on the market anti DNA methylation drug called uh, 5 azacytidine. Um, and um, one course of treatment uh, resulted in a uh, uh, the tumor stopping its growth and the patient regaining their energy and feeling, feeling better. Um, and that effect lasted for 15 months. So that was really amazing because um, we were able to, within a short amount of time, move from basically very little known about this disease collected a few different layers of genomics data, identified a molecular mechanism that seemed to be important in one type. Well, first of all, we identified that there's two types, then a molecular mechanism that's important in one type, and fortunately there was a drug available, uh, multiple drugs available, including an on-the-market drug, and we were able to, to see an effect in a patient, and now there's a, two clinical trials funded and are showing very, very good effects. Yeah? So within the bed set up tumor, you said that each one of them had like different genes that are affected, but all together they affect the same pathway. So how do you know which gene to target each one of them? So in this in this case, um, we had a very clear signal because there was just one pathway that was enriched in the uh -huh. DNA methyl in the differentially DNA methylated genes. Uh -huh. Normally, if you get lots of pathways, you don't know which one to target. So, um, so my question was, in the same pathway, how do you know which gene to target? Oh, in this case, uh, there's only one uh, methyl transferase that is known to be this complex. People know how this complex works, and there's an important methyl transferase that's important in the, fu the major function of the protein, which is you know methylating histones. And so you can inhibit that. And it's an enzyme, which is easier to inhibit, and there's drugs available. Uh, so that was... A, a, the first one, the only one, and the first one that you would check. Um, normally, if you're interested in in drugs, we can. I don't think we're covering this in the lecture, but we can definitely talk about um, annotating pathway analysis, enrichment analysis with known drugs. So, say you have a pathway that has 20 or 50 genes in it. Um, there's a data. There are databases of known drug targets, and you can just. Uh, you can just annotate those pathways with all the known drug targets. Um, so it will at least give you a set of, a quick, quickly give you a set of drugs that are connected um, to the pathway, and it could be knocking down, it could be and you know uh, not uh, promoting it. Drugs act in different ways. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, there's more work to be done to understand which drug you would might use in an experiment or how it works, but at least uh, you can very quickly get to that point of having a list of drugs. And then, as I said, there's just one option. So it was, it was, uh, it was the most clear example of a pathway enrichment result we've ever seen, and we usually don't see examples so clear. So, um, okay, so so those are two examples that just show you that. Um, just to illustrate the kind of things that you can do with pathway enrichment analysis. There are many kinds of things you can do, but um, those are good examples and um, and and uh, are, are informative. Um, okay, so in, in general, the benefits of pathway analysis are <coughs> compared to uh, analyzing data at the level of transcripts or proteins or SNPs, um, is that the data is the results are usually easier to interpret because they. Uh, deal with familiar concepts like cell cycle um, or metabolism. Uh, they identify possible causal mechanisms that you can follow up on. Um, so these represent, it generates a lot of hypotheses, testable hypotheses. Um, so that's very important is that a lot of these, all these analysis that we do, uh, that we're covering in this workshop, basically are, are hypothesis generating. But they're fairly often fairly specific hypothesis generating um, analyses. Uh, or they, they generate a fairly specific hypotheses. Um, you could use this to predict new roles for genes. So you might find a gene that is involved in a path in a pathway. Uh, uh, it's sort of similar to genes that are involved in a known pathway, but it wasn't known to be part of that pathway. Um, the uh, 
the, the analysis can sometimes improve statistical power. So um, uh, I'll just uh, illustrate this with an example. <coughs> Say you have a, a, a genome-wide association study where you uh, look for mutate you genotype look for mutations in uh, individuals and say you have 10 cases who have a disease and 10 controls who don't have the disease and um, your perfect signal if you're looking for mutations that associate with the disease would be finding a mutation that's present in all 10 individual all 10 cases and none of the controls uh, that would be perfect we never see results like that that way usually it's closer to each individual has a different mutation um, and then you can't really do anything with the results however if you realize that those mutations in the, in the cases are all part of the same pathway, and you've done an analysis at the pathway level where you say which pathway is associated with the, with the cases, then you can say all 10 cases are uh, affected by, potentially affected by mutations um, in this pathway, and none of the controls are affected by mutations in the pathway. And you can compute statistics for that, see how significant uh, it is. And, um, and that takes us from a situation where we have no signal to a situation where we have perfect signal. Um, and the way that that works is kind of one major way, but it's sort of a central concept, which is that um, the pathway information is able to aggregate those single counts into one stronger count of 10. So instead of having a bunch of counts of one, you have one count of 10, and that's just a stronger signal. The other thing it helps with is reducing multiple testing, because usually there are fewer pathways to test than genes. So if you have to test SNP associations in GWAS, you have to correct for uh, the number of tests that you do, and we'll talk about that later. But it, it reduces your statistical, statistical power. So the fewer tests you do, the more power you have. And pathways uh, usually require you to do fewer tests, because there are only thousands of pathways, not millions of, of SNPs. Um, OK, so those are concepts that are used over and over again. Um, and we'll talk about them again. Um, pathway analysis can sometimes be more reproducible because um, it's, uh, there might be lots of ways to affect the pathway, and each time you do an experiment, you find a different way. But then when you, you, they, all, they all connect to the same pathways. So then if you look at things at the pathway level, you might see more reproducibility across your data. Um, it also facilitates integration of different data types. Um, and... Uh, um, uh, because you can analyze all of your different genomic layers with pathway analysis and are all using the same pathways and you can combine them and say which pathways are affected do I see affected from each genomic layer and it, they're, all, they're all talking the same language at the pathway level um, and you can visualize them all together. Um, okay, so we talk about pathways and networks. What's the difference? So pathways, um, you know, they're both representations of biological processes or thing mechanisms that are occurring in the cell. Um, pathways tend to be more detailed, highly confident consensus models of what's happening in the cell, of a particular process. They might, <coughs> they might contain biochemical reactions and um, small molecules or a mix of molecules. Um, usually there are, there, there's less information at this highly detailed level available. It's sort of more textbook knowledge. Um, networks are more uh, uh, simplified. Um, usually it's just what, you know, A connects to B or A regulates B, and you don't know as much about what's going on in the cell, but you have large-scale information that has told you about how things are connected. Like you might have a large protein interaction screen that just gives you thousands of protein interactions, and, um, and that's in a database, and you just want to use all of that information. So both of these, these types of information are useful. Um, the benefits of uh, pathway analysis are, um, are sort of focused on working with pathways is that you might get more mechanistic understanding at a more detailed level. Uh, the disadvantage is that it only works with known pathways. So if you have genes that are not part of known pathways, it doesn't, it doesn't cover them at all. Um, so you have to look at those separately. Um, networks might cover more genes, um, and you can get a nice network that connects genes that are, say, differentially expressed in your in your samples. Um, but then when you get that network, you have to interpret it. So what does that network mean? Um, is this a pathway that I know about? Is this a new pathway? Um, is this you know something that's not a pathway? So that's extra work that's required. Um, so there's different types of pathway and network analysis. The first, the first type that we're going to talk about um, is 
um, that we're going to spend most of today on is uh, pathway enrichment analysis, which, as I mentioned, is the most popular common method. There's tens of thousands of papers. Almost everyone who runs a genomics analysis today usually uh, applies pathway enrichment analysis um, right away at the end if they produce some type of uh, list of molecules. Um, genes or molecules. So, um, and this basically says, you know, what biological processes are um, active in my sample. Um, we can also uh, look at de novo uh, subnetwork construction and clustering, which we're going to talk about tomorrow um, with a Reactome FI Viz uh, uh, analysis. Um, this looks looks at networks instead of known pathways and. As a result, it might find new things that you didn't know about, but you know, known and new. But again, you have to uh, interpret the the networks that come out. And then there's more detailed types of pathway analysis modeling that were that are less commonly used because um, usually you need uh, a lot. You have, they have high data requirements, like you need very detailed pathway models and multiple layers of genomics data to to run them. And so we're not covered. We don't cover them in this workshop, but we can talk about them if you if you'd like. And that might be um, you know looking at uh, how mutations affect a phosphorylation site um, in a pathway and, and the prediction of the effect of that mutation and things like that. Um, okay, so the general pathway analysis workflow. Uh, as I mentioned, we collect uh, genomics data. We normalize and score it uh, according to what's standard for that type of genomics data. So for instance, for RNA-seq, there's a standard pipeline that people run to take the reads from RNA-seq and align them to the genome and identify counts of transcripts and then normalize those counts. Um, and then the result of that is a list of genes for a sample. And if you have multiple samples, then you can compute differential expression between those samples. And that's yet another analysis method. We're not, we don't cover those in this workshop. There are other workshops that cover those, um, and uh, we, you know, the results of those of all of those different methods, no matter what type of analysis you're doing, is a gene list or a molecule list, and um, we start from there. So, but it is important to know that um, that uh, there's a wide range of these types of normalization methods for established data data types like RNA seq or many others. It's very standard how to do this. Usually, the core facility that runs the that collects your sample for you will run these analyses and provide you with a report. So, usually, you don't have to worry about doing it yourself, although you should understand how it works. Um, and then, if you're working with a data type that doesn't have that support, you might have to learn and do these things yourself. Often, these uh, scoring systems are developed in a statistical programming language like R, um, and um, the. Uh, so, so those are just a, a, a sort of general points. Um, the one important take-home message is that it's important to know that those methods are working well, um, and you have to understand and look at the results of those methods. So, for instance, if you compute differential expression between your sample and control, and you don't, you you get some differentially expressed genes, but they're very weakly differentially expressed. You're probably not going to get a good result for your pathway analysis because you don't have a lot of signal in your data. There's not a lot of uh, significantly differentially expressed genes, and that sometimes happens. So why that happens, you might have to go upstream and figure out earlier parts of the process. Um, okay, so um, so you generate your gene list, and then you know we this workshop is focusing on the green part. So uh, we want to learn more about the biology. Um, cellular mechanisms that are important in the experiment. Um, and we can identify interesting pathways and networks and visualize them. We can drill down to understand the mechanism and eventually develop some model and, and publish it. Uh, so that's the general idea. The more detailed version of this is this map that we put together that um, includes in the blue boxes um, more information, or more detail about different types of uh, uh, genomics and omics data that you can produce. Um, some of these, uh, and, and we just put this, we made this very explicit so that you can see what steps in orange here are required to get to your gene list. So some methods like protein interactions screening, uh, those generate the gene list right away without much, um, you know, uh, you identify the proteins right away, whereas other methods require multiple levels of scoring and, and uh, differential expression, for instance, um, uh, analysis before you can get a gene list. Um, and then once you have your gene list, you can look 
for pathways. These are known pathways. Or you could look for interesting networks, which might not be known. Um, and then there's different tools for doing this. Pathway enrichment analysis is what we're going to talk about today. Again, that's the most popular one. Um, these, the, and we're going to talk about, um, uh, actually, we're going to talk about all of these different ones here. Um, and then also visualizing and identifying interesting pathways. And then the other parts of the workshop, we'll talk about thinking about things as, with networks, including transcriptional regulatory networks. Um, and then after you've identified a pathway of interest, that's, you know, you might see 20 pathways or 100 pathways that that are um, that are significant in your in your analysis. You have to filter through those to figure out which ones are interesting. So some of them are going to be known. Oh, I know that. I know that. So those are good because those are po like positive controls. You know that the analysis is working if you find things that are known. Um, and then others might be interesting. It's like, oh, what's going on with that thing? I didn't know that autophagy was important or something uh, in in this uh, um, process. So. You could focus more on that, look at the genes that are involved in that pathway, visualize them, look at more detailed information like more detailed pathway and uh, maps for that pathway. And um, if there's genes that are coming up that don't have a known function, you can predict the function of those genes. We'll cover that with Gene Mania uh, tomorrow. Um, and, and you can put all of these things together. So this, this workshop tries to cover all of these, these bases. Do you usually do both like, in parallel? Um, do you do so, both so I usually start with the easy thing, which is uh, pathway enrichment analysis, which we're covering today. And then um, the, uh, the reason we do that is because, um, it's a good question, I should mention this in, the, in, the, in this lecture, but uh, the reason we do that is that working with known pathways is the most easy to interpret, makes the most easy to interpret results. So um, if you, uh, and, and so you can most quickly get to something like a story or something that, that, that you can think about. Um, if, uh, if you were to go directly to networks and you see these networks come up, sometimes you can be overwhelmed again by networks. And now what do I do with the networks? So we usually start with this sort of simple, uh, easily interpretable pathway enrichment analysis. And then we we identify interesting pathways and then we, we drill down on those. Um, but also understanding that pathway enrichment analysis doesn't cover some set of genes. So we call that the dark matter of the genome, you know, genes that are not annotated and there's a lot of them, like mostly half, usually half, half of any given genome. So those ones we also look at separately and we look for any strong signal like strongly differentiated, differentiated genes, differentially expressed genes um, in that section that don't have any pathways associated with them. And those could then go for a pathway uh, for more detailed literature searching. So maybe they're just not in our pathway database, but people know something about those genes, or maybe um, we know nothing about those genes, but you can look at what they, they bind, what they connect with in networks, and that might tell you something about them. And that's gene mania, um, which we'll talk about tomorrow. Okay, any other questions? Okay. Okay, so um, a quick point about where gene lists come from. So, gene, we're, you know, this workshop again is focusing on gene lists and molecule lists, whatever types of lists you have. Um, but it's important to know where this data comes from because you'll you'll be able to answer different questions based on where the data comes from. So, um, so you can have. Uh, gene lists that come from molecular profiling, like mRNA or protein, and you, you might just want to identify all of the proteins, for instance, in your sample with proteomics. Um, you might be able to quantify them, so that's like another level where you have uh, quant you know, the expression levels of the proteins or, or genes. And then you might want to look at differential expression and uh, rank uh, your genes based on how differentially expressed they are. And also if you have lots of samples, you can cluster things to find out if there's natural groupings in your data, similar things. And that, that um, uh, is, is all biostatistical analysis methods. Um, but again, very standard. Um, if you work with protein interaction data or any kind of molecular interaction data, I don't, didn't hear too many people uh, thinking about that today here, um, but if you're analyzing microRNA targets or transcription factor binding sites, you immediately get a list of things that interact with your molecule of interest. Um, a genetic screen, like a CRISPR screen, um, will again identify a set of molecules or genes that are sensitive when knocked out. Um, and, and there's also genetic association studies. So these are 
things that are associated with disease. Um, so you have to understand what the gene lists mean. So if I'm doing a protein pull down, um, I'm going to get proteins that are probably in complex, like in a protein complex with my protein of interest. If I am um, uh, um, doing a, a some other kind of assay, I might find things that are in the same you know tissue or cell. Uh, or if I'm doing a genetic analysis, I might find things that are related because they're in the same chromosomal location. But mostly we, we, most genomics data does tell us something about pathways that are active. So gene expression data um, tells us about pathways. Why is that? That's probably, you know, we, we, we think that that's because the cell has evolved or the biological system has evolved to um, express genes that it needs when it needs them in an efficient way. So, um, so if you see a whole bunch of genes expressed at the same time as, and also at the same time as each other, those might be part of the same system. Now, multiple systems could be turned on at the same time, so it's not a one-to-one -one relationship, but that is the reason why we think, you know, gene expression data can give us something about, can tell us something about pathways. And so if you think about your data like that and what type of information you expect to get out of your data based on first principles in biology, I guess, um, you can, you can think about what it means, um, what the, what the gene lists mean. Okay. So, um, uh, okay. So I mentioned that there's lots of different types of data that, that generate, um, uh, lots of different types of genomics data that can generate gene lists. Um, again, before analysis, you have to do all of the normalization and quality control that you, uh, normally do. And as I said, if it's not working, then your pathway analysis won't work. So garbage in, garbage out. <coughs> and um, you have to uh, think about a few things. You have to use statistics that will increase your signal versus noise, and that's sort of standard if you have a standard workflow. Um, you might think about geneless size. If you get, if your analysis results in three genes, that's not going to give you much power to do pathway analysis. If you get all the genes in the genome, you're not going to be able to say anything specific. So it has to be some sweet spot in the middle, and usually tens to hundreds or thousands of genes. Um, you know, if it gets into the half the genome, you could still do some analysis, but it's going to reduce your your uh, ability to get signal out of a pathway analysis. Um, and you also have to make sure your gene identifiers are compatible with the software that you're using. Um, sometimes this is more of a problem than others. Uh, we'll talk, I'll talk about it more later. Um, and then, as I said, you, uh, you know, so that's, that's this part right here. Um, and then um, uh, in terms of um, bio, uh, biological, yeah, okay, so so this is sort of what we assume, and just some tips for that. Um, okay, when you actually get to your analysis, as I kind of explained already, and this is just repeating in a little bit more detail, um, you have to understand what you want to accomplish with your list. So hopefully that question is part of your experimental design. Um, but some of the things that you could do is summarize the biological pathways that are, um, are active in your example. The differential analysis might find pathways that are different between samples. You might be interested in finding a controller molecule for your process, like a transcription factor or microRNA that we think is important as a master regulator. Uh, you might be able to find new pathways uh, or pathway members um, and discover new gene function. Um, you might be able to correlate a pathway with a disease or phenotype. Um, and find a drug. So I think we've talked, we kind of mentioned all of these uh, so far. Um, so um, the you know this workshop will help answer all of these types of questions. Um, today we're doing pathway enrichment analysis, which is like summarize the data and compare uh, sample A to sample B or case con to control. Um, and then tomorrow we're going to get more into network analysis, predicting gene function. Um, and then day three is focused on network regulatory network analysis and also the integrated assignment. We used to have the integrated assignment in the evenings, but that wasn't compatible with everybody's schedule, so we moved it to the day. But it's the third it's the third day in the afternoon. Um, hopefully that works out better. Um, okay, so um, just a quick uh, we're going to go into more detail on how this works uh, later, but just a quick. Um, uh, intro to pathway enrichment analysis. 
So the idea with pathway enrichment analysis is that given a set of genes that you've found from your experiment, like you have a thousand genes um, that are different, say, let's say differentially expressed in tumor versus normal. Um, if you find that <coughs> half of the gene list is are genes that are involved in the cell cycle, that's unexpectedly a high number of genes because if you look at the genome, half the genes in the genome are not cell cycle genes. Um, it's only about 5% of the genes in the genome that are cell cycle genes. So having 10 times more than expected of cell cycle genes in your list of 1,000 is enriched. Um, and you can compute a, a statistic for how enriched that is, and you can get a p-value that says this is you know, really enriched. It's very, very, very unlikely to occur by chance according to this, this p-value. Um, and so this Venn diagram is meant to represent genes that you have in your list, uh, and then you have a pathway like the cell cycle that I mentioned, um, and these are, uh, so these are all the genes that are involved in the pathway, and then you look at the overlap between these two, and then you look at the, the significance of that compared to the background universe of all possible genes, like all the genes in the genome. Um, and you do this for every pathway that you have. So if I have a thousand pathways, I'd run the same thing over and over again for each pathway. And then I compute p-values for each of these, and then I can rank the pathways by those p-values. Um, and there's more, a little bit more to it than that, and that we'll get into in more, in more detail. But the end result is a list of pathways that are um, enriched in your data. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, okay, so pathway, so, you no, know, I talked about cool examples of pathway enrichment analysis, like our really great uh, Penamoma story. Um, and, you know, now you guys know the very basics of pathway enrichment analysis. Um, but there's the sort of um, two parts to this. One is uh, your gene list, and the other one is pathways. Where do you get the pathway information? Um, and so, uh, and then you, you put those two things, those two inputs into a pathway enrichment analysis method, like GSEA or G-Profiler. Um, and so I'm just going to cover the, some of the basics of, of these two types of inputs uh, quickly. So, um, so when you have a gene list, there's a few things that you need to know about. One is that genes are identified by some name or number. Um, these are identifiers or IDs. Ideally, they're unique, stable names or numbers that help keep track of these genes in databases. Um, you know, social security or insurance number or entree gene ID, these are examples of unique identifiers. Um, but gene and protein, um, uh, so, so that's great if you have that. Um, there are problems, though, with working with genes. Uh, one is that gene and protein information in any kind of molecule is stored in not one database, but lots of different databases, because everybody can create their own database, and they all use their own, create their own identifiers. And now you might have a problem if, one, if you get a gene identifier from your friend, and you're working with a different database, and how do I know that I'm talking about the same thing, and you have to map those, those one from the other. Um, the other thing is that, um, uh, sorry, I'm just to check, um, yeah, so the other thing that uh, is a problem is sometimes uh, genes you're using uh, names that are not standard identifiers. Um, you might be using the common name for a gene that no database uses, but it's used in the literature. And that, won't, that might not be the best name because maybe actually two genes have that name. And then you're stuck because you don't know which gene you're talking about. So that's why we don't use standard names of proteins, for instance. We try to use identifiers that are standardized. Um, and there's also, uh, the last thing is that it's important to understand that there's different types of identifiers for different types of molecules. So even if we're talking about genes, and this course is all about genes, we know that that genes express RNA and uh, genes are encoded in DNA, which is a molecule that has, you know, we're looking, thinking about a region in that case, and then it's, uh, an, uh, an RNA is expressed and it's translated to a protein. And so the DNA region and the RNA and the protein have different identifiers and there's different databases for different types of information associated with those molecule types. Um, so entree gene at NCBI 
doesn't store sequence information. It just stores the concept of the gene and what it's all about, the function of the gene. And then it links to other databases that have the other more you know, other types of information. So here's a list of different types of identifiers, just so you can see the variety. Um, the ones that are highlighted in, uh, that are uh, underlined um, and in red are the recommended ones that we recommend. Um, it's not always possible to use these because you might be using uh, 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 organism or newly sequenced genome that doesn't have these identifiers and might only have identifiers that you've defined yourself. Um, but in general, these are ones that we recommend. In particular, entree gene and uh, species-specific um, symbols. Like for human, people frequently use gene symbols, which is different than gene name. It sort of seems like a name, but the difference is, is that the gene symbol is standardized, so there's only one symbol per gene, and we know exactly what gene you're talking about if you use that, that symbol. Um, so that's, you know, why it's confusing. So this, you know, this could be very confusing if you have a alphabet soup of these things, but um, so it's good to use standard ones that are commonly used. Um, so sometimes that's more of a, sometimes people don't have a problem with that, sometimes it's a big problem. Um, so there's lots of different identifiers, and if you have this problem, you should learn a system called identifier mapping. Um, and um, there are identifier mapping services, like in gProfiler, um, there's a tool called gconvert. So you can type in, you can pick, copy and paste identifiers from one type and ask to get another type, and it will, it will convert um, them. It doesn't always do a perfect job because um, of a couple of reasons. One is um, there might be ambiguity in identifiers because biology is not perfect, so we don't even the human genome is not finished, and every version of the genome annotation that comes out, genes are still changing, and sometimes they're called a pseudogene, and then they get promoted to a gene, and then they go back to a pseudogene, and back to a gene, and it's like it takes years before people really figure out some of these genes um, and that they're really, you know, encoding something and, and working in a particular way. And so if you get different versions of those databases, they'll disagree on what's a gene, right? And so that's one reason. Um, and so you might not always get perfect matching, but usually you can get a good enough matching to, to for practical use. Um, if you want a perfect matching, you have to go into detail and manually look at all those issues yourself. Um, so uh, I mentioned you need to be aware of ambiguous mapping. So if you, again, there could be cases where uh, one ID identifier in one database maps to two identifiers in another database. Uh, for instance, sometimes people think one region of a genome is a gene, and then they realize it's actually two genes. Um, this, this happens relatively frequently um, over time. So um, uh, the uh, so so you'd have cases like that. Um, okay, so to avoid errors, you need to be, just be aware of these things and check. Um, be aware of one-to-many mappings. Um, use identifiers types that are standard and unique per gene um, so that you reduce the problem of gene name amb ambiguity. Um, also, if you're using Excel, um, you, you probably know that uh, it automatically tries to guess types of data, and sometimes it guesses certain gene names or, or dates or other things. How many people have had this problem? Okay, so so this, you know, OCT4 is a pretty important transcription factor in stem cells, um, and Excel thinks it's October 4th. Um, so you have to paste as text uh, and make sure that, you know, the, the column type, if it says general, if you if you look at the column type, it's just going to guess the type. But if you set it as text or if you paste as text, um, it will uh, it will work properly. Um, this is a major problem if you have thousands of genes because you can copy and paste them around, and then it's it's not even visible on your screen what's happening for all the thousands of genes, right? So you might only find out later that Excel introduced a bunch of errors because now your pathway analysis isn't working. So that's why it's important to be aware of it before you encounter that problem. And I mentioned there's problems reaching 100% coverage. Um, okay, so here's an example of a, a really bad example just to scare you um, <laughs> to thinking this is important. So this is a paper from Nature from quite a while ago now um, where people were studying this HES1 as a target of a microRNA. And uh, unfortunately, they had to retract the paper because it turns out they're working on totally the wrong gene. They did a database search, they pulled out a gene, and there's two genes named HES1. One's like 
they had different cases. Um, so one is, um, you know, homolog of ES1, and one is hairy enhancer of split. So um, unfortunately, they were using the wrong one and had to retract their nature paper. So um, it does happen. Um, okay, so uh, recommendations for proteins and genes. Um, map everything to gene identifier, entree gene identifiers, or official gene symbols using some spreadsheet. Um, and if you want to get more, if you're having problems getting coverage, you can manually curate the missing mappings or use multiple mapping services. Um, and um, one thing to note is that usually this, these, these, these recommendations don't cover splicing. Uh, in general, this whole workshop is focused on genes and a gene can result in multiple splice forms and those splice forms can have different functions, but unfortunately we don't know a lot about those functions and those splice forms. So yes, we have quite a bit of information about uh, transcripts that are um, encoded in genes, but that information is not great. It doesn't have a lot of good coverage, and we also don't, all of our pathway information doesn't, uh, none of the pathway databases have information at the splice variant level. They'll just, they're basically at the protein even though they, they, they list a specific protein, um, it's usually like the longest protein that's expressed from the gene or something like that. Um, occasionally you would have things that are, you know, uh, fo focused on uh, the function of splice variants, but because it's a rare occurrence at this stage in 2018, um, all of the gene and pathway analysis doesn't, doesn't work with that. If you do have splice variant data that you're interested in, specific transcripts, and you have a data source uh, that is... Um, transcript aware, I guess, um, you, can, you can use the same systems that we're talking about. Just to note that the databases don't really have that information for, uh, a lot. Okay, um, any questions so far? Okay, how's my timing? We're supposed to have a break at 10.30? 11? Okay. Um, okay, so we've learned about gene identifiers and um, and that's sort of one part of pathway analysis, um, the geneless part. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about pathways, where they come from, how they, how to use them. Um, okay, so remember, in our pathway enrichment analysis, we had to analyze each pathway one by one. So we have to get those pathways somewhere, and those pathways are generally available in databases. And there's more than one database that exists. Um, so. Um, so pathway information is, is available in databases. Um, uh, there's more than one. So for instance, gene ontology is a, a popular place to get information about gene function, and it includes information about biological processes, which are pathways, basically. Um, and then there's pathway databases like Reactome, which is the, the best example currently, um, that uh, um, stores a lot of detailed information about all of the genes and proteins and, and how they work together. Um, pathways are one type of gene annotation, but there's a lot of other types of gene annotation. So gene ontology also has molecular function, which is like enzymatic function, and cellular location. You could have disease associations. You can have uh, protein properties, like whether a protein has a given domain. Um, you can have uh, information about interactions with other genes transcription factor binding sites. So there's a lot of different types of annotations on genes. Annotation just means you kind of decorate the gene, you associate some information with the gene. So obviously lots of information is associated with genes. Any kind of tag, it's kind of like a tag. You, you tag the gene with whatever information you have. Um, we're focused on pathway information. Um, some databases like gene ontology store pathway information and other information. So sh you should just be aware that uh, when you're using these databases, sometimes you're pulling along more information than you might want. We recommend starting these types of analyses just with pathway information because it's more easily easy to interpret. Um, and uh, if you don't get any results or if you want to go deeper, you can start branching out into these other areas. Okay, so pathway information. So that... I'm going to talk about that next. Okay, how many people know about the gene ontology? Flip your hand. Okay, so pretty good fraction of the people in the class. So I'm just going to go through um, a gene ontology fairly quickly to tell you what it is. So gene ontology is um, a set of 
biological phrases, which are called terms, which are applied to genes. So for instance, protein kinase is a, a term and it's applied to a gene. This gene is a protein kinase, um, or it has protein kinase molecular function or activity. Inter interestingly, um, each term actually has a definition, a full definition associated with it, so it's a dictionary. People don't probably don't know that, uh, don't see that as much, but you can use gene ontology as a full dictionary of tens of thousands of biological terms, so it's useful. Um, and it's also an ontology, which means it's, uh, an ontology is a formal system for describing knowledge. Usually it has relationship, it, ha it defines concepts and relationships between, be between concepts. Um, and this is the website. So here's a kind of example geontology structure. So this top box says geontology, and then it says biological process, and then um, physiological process, and uh, homeostasis, tissue homeostasis, immune homeostasis, B cell homeostasis, and then B cell apoptosis. So as you can see, um, this uh, hierarchy is organized, sort of organizes the terms in a hierarchy that goes from more general to more specific. So the bottom term here, B cell apoptosis, is very specific, um, and um, these relationships are, um, are and, and any gene that's part of B cell uh, apoptosis is also part of any of these other categories, uh, these other terms. And based on relationships like here, and the, there's a different types of relationships, so B cell homeostasis um, uh, is part um, is a type of apoptosis um, that is part of B cell homeostasis. Um, so is a or part of relationships. Um, so it describes multiple level gene function at multiple levels, and terms can have more than one parent, which is important, um, which I'll, I'll mention in, in a sec. Um, sorry, just wanted to check if I included that slide. Okay, so. Um, yeah, so one of the, one of the um, issues that you should know is that um, because a gene is part of, uh, is sort of associated with one term and that term has parents, um, the gene is also automatically or logically associated with all the parents all the way up. So this can create a lot of redundancy um, and you have to deal with it somehow. So we'll talk about that later. So gene ontology covers three t aspects of of gene function, where a, uh, a gene is uh, expressed, so uh, where a transcript or protein is expressed, that's a cellular component, molecular function, which is like the uh, enzymatic activity type, and biological process, which is pathways, pathway information. These pathways, it's called biological process it be, could, because it could be quite generic, like metabolism, but it's all organized into different types of metabolism all the way down to very specific terms. Um, okay, so there's two parts of gene ontology. There's the terms that I talked about, um, and go terms are added manually by cu trained curators um, uh, that work at different databases like model organism databases or Uniprot. Um, they can be added by request, so you could you could say terms are missing for my gene, and experts help with major redevelopment. And um, I didn't update this table, but it's pretty stable these days. Um, there's tens of thousands of terms. Biological process has about 30,000 terms. And, um, okay, so those are the terms. The second part of gene ontology is annotations. So annotations are the actual type of information that we use for pathway analysis, which is um, the, the link between the terms and the genes. So if I have a gene and it's part of cell cycle, I'm going to say, I'm going to make an annotation, I'm going to write down in the gene ontology text file, or you don't need to do it, but the gene ontology creators have done this. They write down that this gene is part of cell cycle. Um, and um, so these are known as gene associations or gene ontology annotations. Uh, there's multiple annotations per gene, so you can have multiple annotations, uh, multiple terms associated with a single gene. And some of the gene ontology annotations are created automa uh, manually, and some of them are, are automatically. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about that. So um, the whole, sorry, the terms, the terms are only three terms? Either There's three types of terms, terms. yeah. Okay. And annotation just... Annotations just are... Just the it just links the term to the gene. Yeah, and you can link as many terms from whatever type you want to your gene. 
Okay, so I talked with this already. Um, so, um, okay, so the annotation information is not just gene A is part of the cell cycle. Um, it has more information associated with it. So it has the evidence associated with it of why someone made that connection. So there's different, and there's different types of evidence. So, um, in fact, there's a lot of different types of evidence. So uh, it's important to just understand a little bit about these, evidence, these types of evidence um, for the purposes of, of uh, using these for pathway enrichment analysis. Um, the most important thing to know is that some of the terms are manually annotated, manually created, and some of them are electronic annotation. Um, and uh, the manual ones, there's two types. There's curated by scientists. They're very high quality, but there's not as many of them because it's a time-consuming process and there's too much literature for the available uh, curators to go through. Um, so they also have computational methods that uh, help them automate this task and they manually review the results of some of these computational methods. Some of the computational methods are extremely high uh, accuracy. So for instance, um, for many years, people have been able to very accurately identify transmembrane regions in proteins based on amino acid pro uh, properties and, and, and um, uh, frequencies. And it's like 99% accurate. So applying that computational method can identify all the membrane proteins and those will all get tagged with a membrane cellular component term and go and you could be pretty sure that those are accurate. Um, some other computational methods are not as good um, but that's why people try to review the analysis results. Um, but there's also a category called electronic annotation which is annotation derived from computational methods without any human validation. It just all goes in and the accuracy varies. Again, some of the computational methods are better than others, right? So we don't, you have to understand how, where the information is coming from if you want to understand the quality level. Um, but people put them in there because they might be useful. So say you are working on an, analysis, uh, on an experiment where you don't find any pathways that anyone knows about, um, but you look at the electronic annotation and you see interesting patterns that come up. At least that gives you a, a, a handle, something that you can go in and a lead that you can follow, um, where you couldn't follow anything from standard analysis. So it can be useful, but um, it's uh, kind of two key points. One is just to understand that these evidence codes exist and that um, there's this electronic annotation, which is typically lower quality. And so what we actually recommend starting without using this um, so start with just the manual annotation, uh, and then if it doesn't work, you could extend it um, to include the electronic annotation. Um, so here are all these different evidence codes. So they actually have names. Um, the electronic annotation is called IEA, Inferred from Electronic Annotation. But there's other ones like Traceable Author Statement, which will have a publication reference associated with it. And there's Inferred from Physical Interaction, which will actually, if you look in the annotation, it will say, it, I, I, I annotated this to the cell cycle because it interacts with this uh, cyclin protein. Uh, it's very well known. Um, and so this you can have this in your notes just to uh, understand the different types. Um, and IEA is the one that we recommend removing from initial analysis unless you're working in an organism that doesn't have any uh, of these things. So that's the next point, which is that most major, all major eukaryotic model organisms in human are pretty well covered by gene ontology. Um, several bacterial and parasite species, um, and uh, there's always new species in development, but um, there is a variation. These, each one of these is hard to see here, but each one of these is different species. So this is rat, human, um, this is out of date uh, now. Actually, it's only two years old, but um, this changes over time. So you can see that uh, the, the blue is the sort of curated data and, um, uh, oh, sorry, the green is the, green is the data that comes from evidence codes that are associated with experiment and, um, and the, the blue are the predicted ones. Um, and the, uh, the main thing that you can see, and this is the number of annotations, the main thing you can see is that there's variation between species. So some species, uh, are much more annotated than others. And if you're working with an organism that doesn't have any annotation um, or a newly sequenced genome, you have to use 
electronic and inferred from electronic annotation. And the way that it's inferred always is by taking all of the gene ontology annotation from the closest well-covered species and just transferring it all over by orthology to the species that you're working with. And so those will all be considered electronic annotation that's unreviewed. Like in humans, the experiments are only like does it tell you where the experiments come from, like in mouths or cell lines? It will. It, it does give you information, not a lot of detailed information like that, but it will say it came from this paper or something like that. So um, we don't usually go into that level of detail unless there's a um, problem. Occasionally we find pro like uh, misannotated genes or something like that, and then we'd, let, we'd report them. Okay, so just for your information, here are some of the databases that contribute to the gene ontology all the major model organism databases. Okay, so there's a, there's a lot of, um, so there's uh, one other thing that's useful to know about gene ontology, um, which is that there's something called slim gene ontology sets. Um, gene ontology has too many terms for some uses, so sometimes you just want to summarize a whole bunch of genes in terms of the function, like the, uh, you know, which cellular component, which cellular locations are, are present in my, in my uh, gene list. Um, and um, if you just use gene ontology, you've got hundreds of terms probably. So GoSlim is an officially reduced set of Go terms that exists to make a simplified view um, of kind of higher level terms. So we don't use it too frequently, but sometimes it's useful. Any questions? Any other questions so far? Okay. So um, so this, the schedule is really 11 and then 11.30 break, uh, break to 11.30. Okay, so we're still uh, good. Um, okay, so there's also a lot of gene ontology software tools. Um, these are uh, freely available to anyone without restriction. Almost everything that we talk about, and I should have mentioned this in the beginning, um, this course focuses on freely available resources. Um, everything that we talk about basically is um, free for anyone to use without restriction. Um, you can download it and use it yourself and change it if, if you want. Um, so gene ontology is also like that. Um, there are ontologies, there's the gene associations, and then there's, uh, uh, which are files, and then there's tools that are developed by gene ontology, and also lots of tools Lots of groups have developed tools that use gene ontology. Um, one tool that's pretty useful if you're interested in looking at the gene ontology is called QuickGo. Um, this is just a search engine for gene ontology. Uh, you can type in terms and you'll get information about the gene ontology. Um, just a quick conceptual mention that there's other ontologies as well. Um, so here are some examples. Um, there's like a cell type ontology that's being developed now, and there's a phenotype, human phenotype ontology that captures all diseases. Uh, so there, there are lots of them, and sometimes you might come across them in your analysis, although infrequently, and we don't cover them in the rest of the class. Okay, um, I talked about gene ontology. That's a very important uh, source of uh, information about, of pathway information. Um, the one important thing to know about gene ontology compared to the other types of pathway resources that exist is that gene ontology only can define gene sets. It doesn't tell you anything about how the genes are connecting to each other, like A regulates B, doesn't have that information. It just says this gene's part of the cell cycle and then another gene's part of the cell cycle. And so if you, if you look at the cell cycle, you could say what genes are annotated as part of the cell cycle and you'll get a list of 100 genes. So that represents a set of genes, and that's the input for the basic type of pathway enrichment analysis that we'll talk about today. Um, but there's also a lot of different types of pathway databases that have more information. Um, uh, PathGuide is a website that we've actually put together that lists actually now 700 pathway-related databases. Um, MCDB is a database that's made by the Broad Institute, um, who also makes the group that made GSEA, which we'll talk about today, um, gene set enrichment analysis software. And so this MSIGDB is a, is a database of gene sets. And Pathway Commons is one resource that, that we happen to work on that collects major pathways. Um, and um, actually, what we'll talk about later, we have a, my lab collects a bunch of pathway databases together and makes a, 
um, a gene set database that's easy to use with these pathway analysis tools. And so um, we update it every month. It's only available for human and mouse, but um, that's another set that exists that's sort of uh, friendly. Um, okay, uh, and then um, okay, so I'm actually almost done. Um, I think we started a little bit early, uh, 10, 15 minutes early um, for, uh, in the schedule, so we'll have a little bit more time for, for break. Um, but um, uh, um, I think we're, we're going to go into more detail about Reactome tomorrow because uh, Lincoln Stein, who is the one of the PIs for Reactome, and actually so we have a Reactome developer in the room, um, He's going to teach tomorrow, uh, and is going to talk about rea uh, Reactome. So, um, Sorry. yeah. So let's say you have a you do the pathway, pathway analysis, and then you have a gene set that you thought it wasn't reached. It depends on where it is in the tree, right? On how specific it is. So let's say yeah. you got cell adhesion, for example. Do you know that it's, it's like a pathway that the gene interacts with each other, or like what what kind of level of information do you get from that? So, um, so the question is, if you get some general term coming out, like cell adhesion, yeah. what do you do with it? Yeah. Um, so we'll talk about that more in detail uh, with the pathway enrichment analysis um, section next. But the basic idea is that um, we like to focus the pathway enrichment analysis on terms that are the most useful. So very terms that have lots and lots of genes, like a thousand genes associated with it, usually they're very general. So we apply a filter that says, don't include genes higher than 200 or 300. Don't include uh, pathways that have more than two, uh, two or 300 genes associated with them. And also genes that are pathways that only have two or three genes associated with them, we, you know, or, or some small number we remove. So we, we, we have a sort of sweet spot of like 10 to 200 or 20 to 300 or something in that range. And that usually um, identifies the pathways that are the most useful to see as a result. Yep. So so that's another question we'll talk about later in more detail. But uh, the question is, um, if you have, you know, this this is applicable to transcriptomics, for instance. You have uh, genes that are upregulated and also genes that are downregulated. And in the middle, there's genes that are not re differentially regulated, right? So there's kind of two halves of that list. And um, the question is, is do you just do the top half separate from the bottom half or all together? And, and the, actual, the answer is that you can choose. Um, the basic idea, the basic types of analyses, by, by default, they, they, separ they do the analysis separately. Um, but one of the disadvantages with that is that you might have uh, genes that are both positive and negative regulators uh, in, within one pathway. And this analysis will separate those out and you might not get as strong a signal. Um, and so what you can do is you can combine those together by taking the absolute value of the uh, enrichment scores and just having everything ranked from differentially expressed to not differentially expressed. So that's an option that you can you can use but the default is thinking about things as up and down regulated the advantage of that is that the pathways then have a little bit more meaning to them because you could say this pathway is going up this pathway is going down or it might not be going up and down it's you could say this pathway is enriched in the genes that are up regulated this pathway is enriched in the genes that are down regulated and usually we might say that pathway is probably getting you know definitely members of that pathway are getting expressed um, or or downregulated, um, and then what that means, you know, could be dependent would depend on the pathway, if it's a positive regulating pathway or negative regulating pathway. Does that make sense? Yeah. Did you have a question too? Yes, I just wanted to like clear in my mind. So, do you consider gene ontology analysis as a part of the pathway analysis, or it's more like yeah? Like so yes. Um, so as I said in the beginning, pathway network analysis for us is any kind of analysis that involves prior knowledge of cellular mechanisms, um, however they're re represented. So gene ontology has three parts. I'd only consider the biological process 
analysis with the biological process part to be pathway analysis. The other two types, cellular component and molecular function, not cellular component analysis and molecular function analysis. So um, that's why it's confusing sometimes. A lot of tools just throw all the gene ontology together. It's not a good thing, in my opinion, to do that because um, it messes up the results. Like you, you, you combine all those concepts together and you'll see things that are really related, but they're, they're just um, creating a lot more terms for you to deal with. And also, because you use more terms, it, it harms the multiple testing correction problem, which we'll talk about later. So it reduces the statistical power. And a lot of those are very re redundant. Um, like, often you'll get a molecular function term that's all the genes are the same as a pathway term that just happens to be the pathway that is the only pathway that's associated with that molecular function. Um, so yeah, we recommend just focusing on the biological process terms of gene ontology. And then to answer your question, everything um, that has anything to do with cellular mechanism of any kind, like a, a process, um, we consider pathway or ne uh, or network analysis. Say, I, I usually just use the term pathway analysis because if I'm just explaining it to someone, biologists, every biologist knows what a pathway is. Many biologists don't know what a network is, um, or they think of different types of things when they think of networks. Um, but in this class, we'll definitely talk about networks and teach you about networks. Um, any other questions? Okay, so um, uh, <coughs> okay, so just to continue and finish off the last few slides of this uh, intro. Um, there's lots of different pathway databases. You can go look to see what types of pathway databases exist at pathguide.org. Um, and then there's other types of annotations, which is get actually uh, apropos to the question that was just raised, um, which is, you know, that are, that are not pathways, uh, like chromosome position. Sometimes this is useful. Um, actually, um, if you're working with data that can be affected by chromosomal changes, uh, which includes transcriptomics data. So sometimes you'll get um, pathways that come up in a transcriptomics experiment like olfactory receptors. And it, you'll also get related pathways like GPCR signaling and sense, sensing and things like that. Some of those sound interesting, like GPCR, that sounds interesting. It's a signaling pathway. Um, so many times that, that comes up because there's an amplified region of the genome that um, amplifies, uh, happens to amplify a set of genes that's all next to each other on the genome. So olfactory receptors are all next to each other on the genome. And if they get amplified, then you get hundreds of genes all that all have the same pathway amplified. And so all those genes will get over, will be, look like they're overexpressed. And they'll, you'll get a really strong signal for all olfactory receptor pathway um, coming out and it will say, and you'll say my olfactory receptor pathway is enriched. Um, and so that's true, but why is that happening? Well, one thing that you can do is analyze your data based on chromosome position and you might find that um, uh, based on chromosome position gene sets, so these are gene sets that are defined with, uh, they put genes together if they're in similar regions in the chromosome. So like there's different ways of doing this of course, but you could have uh, different um, chromosomal standard locus uh, numbers or just whole arms of chromosomes. Um, and then you can um, see if any of those positions are also enriched in your data. So it's a totally different question. It's not asking if, if there's a pathway that's changing. It's asking if there's some uh, chromosomal position information that's explaining my data in some way. Um, transcription factor binding sites, that's uh, another example. So say we have a database of known, um, and actually in MCDB, one of the sections of MCDB includes gene sets that are uh, predicted targets of transcription factors and also microRNAs. So if you use that database as your gene set database, um, you can identify genes that are enriched in the targets of a transcription factor. And that might help, I say that that might, you might uh, find a transcription factor um, you might find that transcription factor targets are really enriched in your genes that are upregulated. And so you might say, oh, that means maybe that transcription factor is a regulator in my system and you can go test it. Um, and uh, so you can ask, answer, you can use this 
type of analysis to answer different questions, but it's very important to think about what the database you're using is. It's frequently a lot of databases, they just have these defaults and many of them actually don't make sense to me because they, for instance, will just use all of gene ontology altogether, um, which as I explained, does, I don't think makes sense. Um, and so, uh, but many of them will also allow you to choose which databases you want. And so you can just choose depending on your question. Um, I would not recommend just clicking everything because you'll get less statistical power um, for your analysis and many more terms and then you'll just be overwhelmed uh, with terms. So um, you can always do that analysis but I recommend for starters just work on a pathway level and then you can branch out. Um, okay so there's there's lots of uh, these types of uh, other types of information about genes. Um, I mentioned transcription factor binding sites and some other things are in MSIGDB. Um, uh, gene and genome annotation databases like Entre Gene and Ensemble and Uniprot, uh, at least for proteins, have a lot of information about uh, genes that you can download um, on, in bulk. So, for instance, um, if you uh, there's a, a tool called Biomart. Um, if you select genes, and I'm, I'm not going to go through this in too much detail, but you have it in your notes if you want to try it out. Uh, oops. Um, you can select the gene database and then an organism, and then after you wait a few seconds, um, it, 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 you can select filters and you can say, I only want um, uh, genes on a particular chromosome, or I only want genes that are limited to my list. And then you can um, select attributes, which are like annotations, um, which would be, uh, could be gene ontology terms, but it could be protein domains, it could be gene lengths, it could be all sorts of information, <coughs> chromosomal positions, and so you can use this to kind of go shopping for information about your gene in bulk. Um, of course, the information is available on a per gene basis if you search these websites one gene at a time, but this helps you get information in bulk, uh, so sometimes that's useful. Um, okay, so so we've learned about um, pathways and attributes and, or annotations in general are available from databases and there's lots of different databases. Uh, we'll be focused on kind of common databases that we that most are applicable to most things here but during the breaks we can talk about any other resources that are available that might be useful for particular projects. Um, and, um, and you can try these. Uh, I would recommend that you just poke around on these URLs and see what they're all about um, in these URLs as well, just to um, get, understand that they exist and what they do. Um, okay, so again, um, you know, the rest of this, uh, um, so we talked about the sort of general pathway analysis workflow. Um, for, the, the after, for the next session after the break, we're going to talk about list-based pathway enrichment analysis, where you have a list of genes and that's it. Um, we're going to talk about rank-based pathway enrichment analysis where you have a ranked list of genes, so not just a list, but you, 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 you've you ranked them by something like differential expression. Um, and then um, this afternoon we're going to talk about this box here, visualizing um, your results and, uh, um, and uh, uh, drilling, uh, drilling down to identify interesting pathways. Um, and then um, we don't talk about all of these tools in the workshop, but we talk about at least something related to each of these boxes. Um, and uh, these boxes here will be more focused uh, um, tomorrow and the next day. So tomorrow will be Reactome and Gene Mania. Um, and also, um, here's Gene Mania as well, which helps you predict gene function. Uh, and then um, one thing that's not on here, but it's listed it's sort of as a tool, but it's listed here as transcription factor targets. Um, day three will be focused on gene regulatory networks and thinking about about those. Um, okay, so this this is a, a lab that we used to do as an actual lab, but is now just included as a um, something you can do if you want, uh, just to learn about identifiers and biomart. Um, so you don't have to do this; it's optional, but it just at least gives you a little bit of information to uh, to to do. Um, okay, so I think we're we're early. Um, we're running early, so um, uh, maybe I can take general questions from everybody, and then uh, uh, and then after that we can 
go on a break and we can maybe come back at a, a little bit earlier time. Um, so any other general questions about anything at all? No? Okay, so um, we'll be around during the break so we can ask answer questions, but let's say it is quarter to 11, um, and I think that makes sense because we sort of started about 15 minutes earlier. Um, and so should we come back 15 minutes earlier? Mm -hmm.